Hello, and welcome to another episode of Joe and Cat Chats. Oh my goodness, we're mixing it up again. <laughs> so yeah, so Joe uh, found this streaming platform. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're gonna be doing these things live again, which is very yep. exciting for both of us because we were missing out on the engagement that we used to get on the Instagram lives. Mm -hmm. um, but since we had those technical issues, we had moved to Zoom. Uh, and now we're here. So hopefully we'll get some engagement. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free if you're watching uh, live to comment and we can, we can have a discussion. Uh, today on Joe and Cat Chats, we're talking about the vocabulary of politics. How are you, Joe? I'm awesome with a capital A. As you can see, um, I'm wearing college gear from one of my alma maters, the Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I decided to wear this, this, these garments today because today is World Giving Day. Mm -hmm. It's World Giving Day. And, and you know, I didn't get my master's degree in nonprofit management from Wake Forest. And actually, it should be over here. It's from the University of Baltimore. But today's World Giving Day. And there's a lot of colleges and institutions that need money. And today's World Giving Day. And there's about eight or nine different ways that nonprofits get revenue, you know, foundations, grants, in-kind donations, um, fee for service, interest from investments. Oh, gosh, let me think. Um, government grants and contracts, um, corporate philanthropy, and nonprofits can actually earn money. It's not illegal for a nonprofit to earn money. So, you know, if you have if you have a nonprofit or a charitable organization that you want to donate money to, today is a really good day to do that because today is World Giving Day. There's a couple of nonprofits that I think are definitely worth giving your hard-earned money to. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund is certainly one of them. The Marshall Project, which is an excellent media organization. The ACLU is excellent. They do excellent work. The Anti-Racism Fund is always wonderful. And uh, an organization that's dear, near and dear and close to my heart, the International Rescue Committee. They help refugees get resettled into the United States. I was an intern for them for about seven or eight months a few years ago. And they do some excellent work. And with the refugee crisis that is taking place around the world, including the United States, they, they could certainly use all the money they can get. So Today's World Giving Day. Please donate if you have the financial resources and capabilities to do so. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. And welcome. admittedly, I did not compile a list as I should have of some okay. organizations I care about, but I will do that right after we finish recording today and I will put them in the show notes. Um, mm -hmm. Because yeah, it's also World AIDS Day. Definitely. And I think that that's a really important thing for, uh, for folks to be paying attention to as well. So it would be Fantastic if you could spread your money to some of the wonderful organizations that Joe just mentioned, along with uh, maybe some organizations that are helping to fight AIDS, uh, or maybe some uh, general LGBTQ plus organizations that help, um, you know, folks that are vulnerable or marginalized uh, get away from violence, things like that. Uh, there's fact, certainly lots. Added. Actually, in fact, I have a couple that you might be able to donate to. Oh, great. Yes. Um, one of them is the Black AIDS Institute. They not only deal with AIDS, but they also deal with AIDS within the LGBTQ community. So there's that. The San Francisco AIDS Foundation is another organization that does wonderful work. And of course, when we're talking about AIDS, the International AIDS Society does amazing work. So those are three organizations that not only could use your money on World Giving Day, but they could use your financial resources in order to help the help slow the spread and eventually eliminate AIDS. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Oh my goodness, Joe, we have so yeah. much to talk about today. A whole lot. A we whole lot. We have a whole lot. Yeah. So we sort of just came up with a bunch of terms that we wanted mm -hmm. to define because we realized that we talk about a lot of this stuff without really understanding or knowing what it means. Uh, and so it was cool to kind of go through this, to take a step back and really dig into what all of these terms mean. Uh, so I ended up dividing our terms into sort of categories so that hopefully it'll make sense to to the viewers um so why don't we get going <laughs> well, absolutely and, and you know i remember what 
when I was when I when I thought about this idea, I was like, you know what? There are all these words, but we don't know we don't really we don't know what they mean or you know, we use them incorrectly. So we're gonna try to set the record straight. That way when you know, when you watch the previous episode that we did about language, which I think was episode 19 of the Joe and Cat Chat mm-hmm. series, we talked about language and language being a system of structured human communication. And again, in typical Joe and Cat Chat's fashion, we always start off with defining some terms. That way we can dip our toes in the water and ease our way into the conversation. So we talked about you know language, but we didn't define what vocabulary actually is because today's episode is the vocabulary of politics. And so you're probably like, well, Joe, what exactly is vocabulary? Vocabulary is words used in a language. Quite simply, that's all it is. It's just a bunch of words that you use in a language. And each language has their own words. There are some words that are going to be used in a particular language that may not necessarily show up in a particular language. And if you remember from the language episode, we talked about there was a terminology that I mentioned in that episode called modulation, where you there, there's a particular term in a language that might that in order to convey that meaning, which is communication, transfer of meaning, understanding of meaning, in order to convey that idea or concept, you have to try to convey that me- word or communicate that terminology without it may not necessarily directly translate from source language to target language. So there might be a language where the word hot doesn't exist. So the modulation of hot would be not cold. Mm -hmm. For example, I think in in Turkish, the word kick does not exist. Mm -hmm. So the, so the, the way you would get around saying the word or conveying the meaning of the word kick would be to strike use your foot to strike a particular object, such as a ball, or if you're kickboxing a person. So so vocabulary, there's four types of vocabulary. You have listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Once again, Mm -hmm. listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And so much of the vocabulary that we're gonna discuss today involves all four types of vocabulary, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So again, we wanna make sure that everybody understands what we're going to talk about and how deep we're going to dive into this because yeah we're going we're going way way under way under real deep today amazing i'm excited <laughs> and i think yeah i think it's it's going to be really interesting because we're going to we're going to dive right into politics right away because okay. uh, that's what we do this is joe and cat chats we're a political uh couple of, of folks so you know that's that's what we got to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So far away, Miss Wells, what's on tap? All right. Well, I thought we could start with what is politics? That's a great idea. I like it. What is it? I mean, you got that one. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, God. I can write it down. You know what? No, you're right. You're right. I, yeah, you know, I was like, wait a minute. I thought you had that one. Yeah, politics. It's ac- activities involved with governance. Okay. Right. And usually when you talk about governance, it's usually a debate between political parties to decide who's going to be in power and who's going to have some sort of control over the group of people that they're assigned or elected to govern. So Mm -hmm. politics, we just had the United States election almost a month ago, and that is a perfect example of politics. Now, there's a bunch of different concepts involved with politics that we're going to, def- to define later today in this episode. And in next week's episode, we do part two of this, of the, the vocabulary of politics. But when we talk about politics, it's all of the stuff that goes into governance. It, it's elections, it's campaigning, it's, it's hiring a staff, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's public debates against your political opponents to make sure there's some sort of public accountability, but not only public accountability for our elected public servants and our incumbent public servants, but there's also a public vetting process for our public officials and our public Mm -hmm. servants. That way, when they say, yes, I'm going to give you Medicare for all, or no, I'm not giving you a stimulus package or COVID-19 relief, you have reasons as to why you should place your vote with that particular party or person, or place your vote with another political party or another person. Or if you don't like any of them, you can just write yourself in because that's an option also. Yeah, we're gonna go over a lot more uh, in detail in a bit here, but yeah, so politics, yeah, I feel like that also involves uh, an ideology. It involves, you know, 
our opinions and our our uh, tendencies toward you know the the government agency or structure I guess is a better word for that uh, in general so absolutely. yeah so we're gonna dive in for sure absolutely and when we and you mentioned a word that I think needs defining also you mentioned the word ideology and an ideology is a set of beliefs or ideals or ideas that creates that political theory or quite honestly policy so if you have a, an ideology that is populist. And we talked about that in a, in a couple, of ep, couple of episodes ago, where you wanna serve the people, then okay, that is your ideology. Where if you have an ideology that's rather conservative, where you know what, I don't wanna spend money and I only wanna serve the 1% and I don't care about LGBTQ rights, or I don't care about um, black people or indigenous people or people of color, then that's your ideology. And the politics involved with your ideology will determine whether you get voted to be public office or not. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot involved in, in ideology. I think uh, in, you know, our lived experience is involved and, and out external factors are also involved. And it's, it's sort of this big encompassing thing that, you know, can change, can, you know, be fluid over time. Um, but often people do get really uh, embedded in those beliefs, in that ideology. And, and it, that's an interesting thing, because that's very much part of the human condition. Absolutely. Sure, absolutely is. It absolutely is. And, and then something else we talked about, and I mentioned in that previous ep definition of ideology is policy. And policy is defined as actions by a governing, government or a business or an institution that has a particular set of desired outcomes or, or what we talked about called SMART goals that, mm -hmm. that want to be achieved. So, you know, you could have a, so if you're a corporation, for example, you could have a no smoking policy. Mm -hmm. Or if you, if you, are a particular organization, for example, the military, you can have a particular recruitment policy mm -hmm. or a particular organization that is private. You might say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm, my, our membership policy, for example, the, there's, there's the Augusta National Club where the Masters Golf Tournament is played. And for years they had a policy where no women were allowed to be members of the group, of the, of the club. They also had a membership policy where no black people were allowed to be members of the group. That is a policy. It's like, hey, you know what? This is what we want. We want to have an all white institution or we want to have an all black institution or we want this institution is designed for Filipino Americans, for example. This is what we want. This is our policy. Here's who we want in this organization. So a policy is how you want this organization to be set up and the rules and actions taken to make sure that the organization meets your, to use a nonprofit terminology, mission and vision statements. Yeah, and when we're talking about policy in sort of a government sense, it, like these policies that people run on as far as like their platform, that's mm -hmm. what's determining for most people. I mean, it's not always that, but uh, a lot of times that's what uh, is determining who you're gonna vote for, particularly in Canada, because there are more than two parties. Uh, and so policy is really an important aspect of, of like your political civic duty, basically. Correct, correct. correct. And the, ex the, the formal expression of your civic duty with respect to politics, we discussed that, we had an entire episode on this conversation, of this topic, is voting. Yes. It's, it's what you did, it's like, hey, you know what, this is what I believe politically and I'm gonna express my ideas in the form of a vote. And we talked about the four amendments that give Americans the right to vote, but we're not gonna go down that road because it's a long road. But the people, this is another related topic with, re, with respect to politics and policies and ideologies. Politicians, because we gotta talk about them. And the politicians are the people who are involved in politics and they're usually elected officials. Yeah. They're usually elected officials. It's like, hey, you know what? Yeah, I, Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House and Joe Biden is the President of the United States. And, um, Brandon Scott is the current mayor of Baltimore. Yeah. So, so you have elected officials. Emmanuel Macron is the current elected president of France. And the body politic is the group of people that are allowed to vote. Actually, let me rephrase that. That's the electorate. The electorate is the group of people that are allowed to vote. 
based upon the rules and laws of the state or the nation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then we have the body politic. And the body politic is essentially the people of that state or nation that make up a group of organized citizens. So you have the body politic, but from the body politic, we get an electorate. So the body politic for all intents and purposes would be the population. And the electorate would be, let's, let me go back to the voting episode. We talked about the 100 million project from the Knight Foundation, where you have a population of approximately 330 million people, but the eligible voting population, eligible voting body is about 245, 250 million people. The 250 million people is the electorate. So, okay, well, that's that's an important distinction that I didn't actually really understand or, or, well, I guess I understood it, but it was not super clear before. So that's really helpful, thank you. You're very welcome. This is what we're here for. We're here to help and we aim to please. Of course, yeah. Uh, so what about, let's, let's talk uh, liberty and justice. What are those? Wow, okay, now these are, these are real different they're, they're quite different. And the other terminology that needs to be discussed with liberty and justice is freedom. Mm -hmm. And there's a document that was ratified in the United States on March 4th, 1789. And I can reach over and grab it right here. Looky here. Oh my gosh, it's the United States Constitution. Imagine that. <laughs> I'm a handy brother. And it says here, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, okay? Ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. That is the preamble to the constitution. And there are two terminology, two words in there that are mentioned. It mentions justice and it mentions liberty. But the other word that needs to be discussed in this is freedom. Now, freedom is basically the power to do what you want with any sort of limitations. It's like, hey, you know, ah, uh, freedom. I do what I want. Liberty is freedom from government rule or control. There is, notice the difference. Liberty means you can do what you want as long as it's within the constraints of government rule. Mm -hmm. Freedom is you could do whatever you want without the government saying, yeah, no, nah, you can't do that, Joe. No, cat, you see, you can't walk your dog here. No, 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 onus is too big. No, no, we gotta keep the onus at home. So freedom, do what you want. That rules don't matter, okay? You can speak or think without any sort of limitations. Liberty, you have freedom from government control or another foreign government's rule. Now, justice is an understanding or principle that people should deserve, get what they deserve mm -hmm. in a particular time frame. Now, again, justice has a couple of different concepts that need to be added to this discussion. Justice involves fairness and ethics, it involves equality, it involves nationality, law, and it also involves religion. It also involves religion. And again, many of those concepts are discussed in this document or here, right here, the, let me turn it over here, the United States Constitution. And again, the United States Constitution was designed to serve the people. That's why it says we the people. Now, the three principles of, of justice are equity, equality, and need. I'm gonna say that again, equity, equality, and need. Those are the three th principles of justice. And there are four types of justice. And when I break down these four types of justice, they're going to sound familiar because we've talked about these types of justice in previous episodes and previous conversations online. The first type is distributive justice. And distributive justice is essentially who gets what? Mm. Who gets what? An example of distributive justice is a social security plan. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what? Okay, I'm 44 years old. I don't get Social Security. My, my dad is 75. And because the rules say that if you're above the age of 55, you get Social Security, he gets Social Security because it's a type of distributive justice. It's a type of fairness. He's old. He's worked to pay into the system. It's only fair that he gets the benefit from paying into the system. Distributive right. justice. 
Procedural justice is how fairly people get treated. So you talk about the Constitution of the United States, the 12th Amendment talks about, I'm sorry, not the 12th Amendment, it's the 14th Amendment. 14th mm -hmm. Amendment talks about equal protection under the law. That certainly sounds like how fairly get people get treated because on the 13th Amendment, black people didn't get the same treatment that everybody else did, everybody else got. So the 14th Amendment said, you know what? Yeah, black folks, you get the same treatment as white folks, equal protection under the law. That is procedural justice. Right. Now, when you talk about court cases, there's another type of justice called retributive justice. Mm -hmm. That's when you get punished for doing something wrong. If you steal something, you are going to jail and you have to pay a fine for that. But you have to have some sort of rest, re not only retribution, but restitution. Yeah. There is, there is that. Now, the... The fourth one, and we had a lengthy conversation about this, I think we had an entire episode about this, is restorative justice. Mm -hmm. Now, restorative justice is defined as righting a wrong. The best example of restorative justice, reparations. Yes. Reparations. And we define reparations as making amends for doing a wrong. And in this wonderful book by Dr. Sandy uh, Darity, let me put it over here, from here to equality, it says reparations for black Americans in the 21st century. And in the book, he talks about reparations through a three part process called ARC, acknowledgement, redress and closure. And reparations are a form of restorative justice. And those yeah. are the four types of justice. So again, liberty, freedom, justice, people throw these words around and say, yeah, we're fighting for justice. We want justice, which actually does make sense because you do want justice because you want what's fair and you want what you're entitled to simply on the basis of being a human being based mm -hmm. on civil rights and human rights. And we'll talk about that later on in today's episode. But your liberty and freedom, they, they, are, they are related, but they're not synonymous. Right. They're, they're, they're in the same family, but they're not brother, sister. They're more like cousins. Yeah, which is a really interesting uh, distinction for sure. Uh, and an important one, I think, as well. Uh, yeah, and if anyone's interested, we did uh, an episode, I can't remember what number it was, but it was a rep an episode on reparations. That was the title of it. So. I think it was episode 14 or 15. Okay, that. yeah, that makes sense, yeah, so. Something like that. It was a while ago. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was. And then, and then we did a reparations part two, if I'm not mistaken. Did we? We sure did. I don't remember. <laughs> Look, we're ha look. We've done this is episode number twenty six. It's tough to remember every single episode because there's so many of them, and we're constantly looking up new information and not only educating ourselves but educating other people so everybody can learn along with us. Yeah, absolutely. And we do encourage everyone to do so because we're streaming live now again. So yes, yeah, so if you, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free. If you're watching live, exactly. um, yeah. So I okay. So I guess. I I think that the next thing we should talk about is actually like civil rights, human rights, because uh, that sort of aligns with sort of this discussion of, of uh, justice, liberty, freedom. Yes, yes. Now, again, civil rights and human rights have two, again, they're, they're, they're same family, but not brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, you, they're, they're cousins. You see them on family vacation. You might see them at Thanksgiving. You may see them at Christmas. Might go to their birthday party every every couple of years or so. They're family members, but they're not brother sister. Yeah. Now, civil human rights, you get them simply on the basis of being a human being. It's like, yeah. hey, I was born on March 17th, 1976. I have rights. Why? Because I am a human being. I'm a human being. Civil rights are rights obtained by being a legal member of a political state. I'm going to say that again. Civil rights are rights obtained by being a legal member of a political state. Now, there's some obvious discussion points that we need to have here. So, for example, when we talked about reparations both times, we talked about the Constitution and how the Constitution did not did not have black people didn't get anything until the constitution until the 13th amendment and the 13th amendment said hey you know what black folks you're no longer enslaved you are free to go and do what you want now before that 
black people were not considered people. They were considered property. They were not, we were not considered human beings. So as a result, we did not have human rights. So if we did not have human rights, by default, you could not have civil rights. Right. Does that make sense? It's a, yeah. it, it, it's a hierarchy, human, then civil. You can't have civil rights without having human rights. Mm -hmm. but, but you can definitely have human rights, but then have trouble getting civil rights. Now, civil rights, there are, there are some, now there are some situations, for example, when we talked about the refugee situation, refugees, for example, in Myanmar, and how many of the Myanmar, in Myanmar, and the Rohingya, how many of them are stateless people. Now, when you talk about being stateless and the way they are being treated, it's not only a denial of their civil rights because they're stateless and by default of their statelessness, they're not legal members of a political state, but because they don't have civil rights and they're being treated harshly by the Myanmar government, their human rights are being violated. Right. So it's, 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 it's two sides of the record. You see what I'm saying? It's two sides of, it's two sides of the coin. And yeah. both of those sides need to be discussed and need to be elaborated on. And there's a bit more notes that I have specifically on human rights and civil rights. Um, there's an entire United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that was ratified on December 10th, 1948. There are, my gosh, there are, geez, 30 articles here. I'm not gonna read all 30 of them because it would take a good 10 or 15 minutes to go through them all. But I just wanna make sure that there are, I wanna read a couple of them because there's, some of them have some, have a lot of validity to what we're talking about. So for example, some of the Human Rights Declaration um, articles, Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security. That's article number three. What does that sound like? Mm, constitution. That sounds ex <laughs> quite similar to the preamble to the United States Constitution. Um, number four says no slavery or servitude. Wow, what does that sound like? Oh, that sounds like the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Okay. Um, Number five, no torture no, or cruel or inhumane or degrading punishment. Well, wait a minute. There's a constitutional amendment, which I think is the, the Eighth Amendment, where it says excessive bail should not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. So you're seeing a lot of the Constitution of the United States and you're seeing a lot of these declarations from the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that the Constitution already wrote a couple of hundred years prior. There's everyone gets recognized as a person. There's a right to a fair trial. We have that. We talked about that a couple of minutes ago with some of the couple of the amendments, especially the 14th, equal protection of the law. And I think the Ninth Amendment gives the right to a speedy trial or the Tenth Amendment. I can't remember which one it is. But yeah, it, I don't remember everything in the Constitution. But you know, everybody has the right to own property. Everyone has the right to free thought, conscience, and religion. Everybody has the right to free and peaceful assembly and association. That's guaranteed in the First Amendment. It's one of the five rights that's guaranteed in the First Amendment of the Constitution. So there's 30 of these. I urge you to go ahead and take a look at them because they're quite important when you're discussing when you're discussing human rights, because these are rights that you would think wouldn't necessarily have to be written down because we should be treating people like human beings, regardless of what some sort of governing institution or body says we should be doing. But just to make sure that it's simple and plain and clear, and it's written down on a piece of paper and it's on a wall so everybody can know and understand it and realize it and recognize it. The United Nations did that about 65 to 70 years ago. And it's good that they did that. Now, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really interesting exercise because it is sort of dis displaying the uh, connectedness of the human rights with the civil rights. Uh, but it is also telling sort of uh, the UN declaration is a bunch of com countries coming together to, to talk about and outline these things. And that sort of, it, I feel like it's telling because a lot of places don't actually uh, uphold those human rights, uh, whereas places like the U.S. and Canada, uh, our our constitution and our uh, charter of rights and freedoms are 
sort of mirroring those human rights uh, in a lot of ways. So I think it's it's an important uh, thing to sort of point out that that the UN list of rights, human rights, uh, is not followed everywhere. And so, yeah, so that's, this is why it's so topical and important to talk about these things right, right now and, and forever until everyone gets, gets human rights. So I appreciate uh, the example you used as well with Myanmar and uh, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, and I, I'm going to need about another minute or so because there's something I want to make sure I read here and then I want to go back to the definition of civil rights mm -hmm. and then move on to the definition of a failed state. And it's all going to, um, the, the dots are all going to get connected. Now, when we talk about civil rights, civil rights are rights of citizens to political and freedom, political and social freedom and equality. Okay. And the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States guarantees these, these civil rights the right to a free press, the right to practice free religion, the right to free speech, the right to freedom of assembly, and the right to petition the government for grievances. Mm -hmm. okay? So those are civil rights, okay? They're concrete in the First Amendment of the Constitution. And again, you get, you get civil rights based upon being a legal member of a, of a state or a nation, okay? Now, I'm gonna read something to you. I'm gonna read number 25, of Article 25 of, of the, the Human Rights Commission, okay? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 25 says, everybody has the right to an adequate standard of living for self and family, including food, clothes, housing, medical care, and social services and security. And in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or lack of circumstances beyond his control, okay? So the, the United, the, the, the Human Rights Declaration says an adequate standard of living for self, family, including food, clothes, housing, medical care, okay? We talked about that with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as physiological needs. They're basically saying, you know what? Yeah, you're supposed to have physiological needs. And when, some things that happen outside of your control that are no fault of your own, the government should be taking care of you. Yeah. The government should be taking care of you. So if you don't have medical care, the government should be picking up the slack. If you don't have the adequate social services that you that you should be getting, the government's supposed to look out for you because that's what governments are supposed to do. If you get old and you need help, there should be some sort of social services to protect you and help you. Now, given everything that I just read, the United States and quite honestly, Canada and a lot of countries are not doing that for their people. No. They're not doing that for the people. And there's another one of these violations, another, not, not a violation, but another one of these articles that I want to read where it says, it's article number 23, where it says workers' rights. Every, every human being has the workers' rights, including the right to work, the right to equal pay, the right to non-discrimination, the right to decent pay, and the right to form a labor union, okay? Now, when you start talking about going against these set of rules that everybody agrees to, those are violations of this, this declaration. And by default, because you are violating somebody's human rights, those are human rights violations. So when you talk about not being able to form a labor union in the United States or not being able to form a labor union in Canada or France or wherever, that is a violation of people's human rights. And then when we talk about not having an adequate standard of living for yourself or your family and not being able to have food and shelter and access to work and social, social services and adequate medical care, when a government can no longer do that for their people, that is a specific term called a failed state. Mm -hmm. a failed state. And a failed state is when the social, political, and economic systems of a government or a state no longer function properly. Yeah. So when you talk about what's happening in the United States and you talk about what's happening in Canada, now Canada, I know, just launched a, multi, a $380 billion bill to go ahead and offer relief for everybody, which is a lot of money for Canada. But when we start talking about the inability for a government to provide those social safety nets and basic services for its people, 
That is a failed state. And there are perfect examples of failed states around the world. Syria is a failed state. The Central African Republic is a failed state. Sudan mm -hmm. is a failed state. South Sudan, with the Lost Boys of Sudan 20 years ago and the refugee crisis that was created from that, a total failed state. Syria, I, I mean, look at what happened with Syria and the refugee crisis in Syria, failed state. An area of the world that's near and dear and close to my heart, the former Yugoslavia, failed state. The government was deemed illegitimate. The social fabric of the, the, the country disintegrated, the economic system collapsed. And then you had complete fracturing of a country that was once one country that became seven countries. So again, failed states. Now, something that I looked up in a, with, with respect to a failed state, and failed state is somewhat, is I think the real correct term that we should be using, but the more politically correct term is a fragile state. Mm. And there is an index called the Fragile States Index. Now- Oh, interesting, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, it's scored on certain factors. You know how we did the HDI where you talked about education, life expectancy, et cetera. The failed state indicators or fragile state indicators are based on social factors, economic factors, and political factors. So the social factors are religious conflicts, refugees, movement across the country and in and out of countries. Economic factors involve corruption, talking about economic inequality, and economic decline. And we're seeing that happen in a, in a lot of countries around the world. Then you have political indicators for a fragile state. For example, a lack of public services, human rights abuses. And especially in a lot of countries now more than ever, you have security forces that operate with complete impunity and lawlessness. Take a look at the police state that we have right now in the United States. Take a look at the police are doing to the indigenous folks in Canada. Take a look at what the police are doing to people, to Yellow Vest and Black Vest protesters and no, hundreds of thousands of protesters in France right now. So again, failed state. Now, to use a statistical term, there is a positive relationship with the score of the fragile state index and the the likelihood of your state not being fragile. I'm sorry, the likelihood of your state being fragile, okay? So the, the higher the number, the more likely you are to have a fragile state. So countries that have high scores are countries like Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Eritrea. Now, the opposite of a fragile state is a stable state. And countries that have stable states have low scores and are stable. So they have low likelihood of being a fragile state. And the countries that, and, and I'm sure there's probably a strong correlation between high fragile state scores and, high, and, and, and low human development indices. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember the HDI, the yeah. lower the number, I'm sorry, yeah, let me think about this. Yes, the lower the coefficient, the more likely that you have a lower HDI score. So yeah. countries like Niger had like a 0 0.381, while countries like Norway were like 0 0.89, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, you see know what I'm saying? So countries that are stable states are probably are countries like a Finland, Norway, Switzerland, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, New Zealand. Canada was in, I think, in the top 10 also of a stable state. I think it was like top fifteen. Yeah, the, the, yeah, that was that was for the HDI. But in terms yeah. of the, in terms of the fragile states index, mm. yeah, they're 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 quite stable in Canada. The United States was I think like thirty seventh or thirty eighth or something. So yeah, so the failed state again, failed states, and when we talk about civil rights and human rights and human rights violations based upon the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, there's a lot of countries that live up to many of those ideals of taking care of people's human rights, but then there are some blatant and obvious violations of those articles in the, human, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because when you outlined the two, the final two uh, human rights uh, I guess, what are they called? The, on the declaration, I think it was 23 and 25. Yeah. It almost sounded like 
United States and Canada would be failed states. And I think that that is an interesting thing because with these indices mm -hmm. are indicating that, you know, both of our countries, Canada and United States, are sort of doing pretty well according to these indices. But when you actually read the words on the Declaration of Human Rights by the UN, which is a bunch of countries coming together to agree on this stuff, uh, not so great. We're definitely violating human rights. And so that's a really good example of how the indices are created and we need to be asking questions about what is qualified as good and bad in these different criteria uh, and in these statistics. Uh, because we all know that you know statistics can be wonderful tools of understanding, but they can also be skewed in a, one way or another, uh, depending on what, what values you put on to them. Absolutely. I had a statistics professor tell me this years ago, he said, Joe, numbers don't lie, people do. Yeah, fair. <laughs> numbers don't lie, people do. And, and, yeah. and, that, and I never forgot that, and it still rings true. And, and another one of these um, articles that I think needs to, have, needs to be mentioned is free government participation equal mm. access to government services and equal voting rights. That's mm -hmm. article 21 of the Declaration of Human Rights. Think about, think about voting in the United States, gerrymandering, voting suppression. We had an entire episode on voting and the many ways that voting has been suppressed, especially in the BIPOC community. Mm -hmm. And so think about that. If you're not allowed to vote, and your right to vote is being hindered. That is, by definition, a human rights violation. Absolutely. And, and so, in episode one of our our ongoing chat series, I, I said something. I think I used these exact words. I said we must internationalize the struggle. Yeah, absolutely. I think I even said that. Mm -hmm. And and what I meant. And I don't know if I necessarily explained it the way I'm going to explain it now. I'm just thinking of this right now. But the way I think we internationalize the struggle is going beyond the governments of our nations, is going beyond the governments of the United States and Canada. And we appeal to an international body, and the international body being the United Nations. Because again, the United Nations is a group of nations that are united and agree to uphold these certain ideals of human rights. Sort so, of. Sort of, kind <laughs> of. That's kind of the idea. So, so when we talk about, so when we talk about, you know, the right to social security, which is Article Twenty Two of the in the Declaration, and how previous presidents in the United States have tried to cut social security, and actually not even tried to cut social security, but had cut social security. For example, Bill Clinton did that. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about not only cutting social security, but trying to take it away on a permanent basis, then that's a human rights violation. Yeah. And, and it should be more than just, hey, I'm suing the United States government because I'm not getting social security. This is, hey, look, I'm not getting my human rights addressed because, hey, I'm supposed to have this simply because I exist. Yeah. This isn't right that my government's doing this to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think that I think that, that was kind of a, an unsaid thing, an agreement between us uh, throughout this entire time of, of the Joe and Cat chats, because we have been talking about global issues repeatedly as mm -hmm. they, you know, unfold and, and different different things happen over you know, over the course of this last few months that we've been doing this. And I think that that is such a good point to make explicit because we do need to to really look at the, the global circumstances that we have and examine the problems in that and really begin to, to unify and begin to, uh, you know, make changes that are going to help those who are vulnerable in more than just our own little communities. And as, I mean, as, a, as someone that has researched social movements, I mean, the, the biggest changes tend to do happen, tend to happen on a local level first before we can make any changes uh, in a more broad sense. But I do totally agree with you that we need, we need this to be a global movement 
because the struggles that we face, the struggles that we've been talking about for months, these are unifying things that we need to, you know, kick out those in power and, and you know, implement more inclusive policies, uh, more inclusive governments. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. <laughs> we're Kat, committed to it. We're committed to it. And Kat, I thoroughly agree with you. And there's a fancy word that we talked about that makes not only thing inclusive, we mentioned diversity and inclusion, but moreover, the word that we want to make sure that we highlight and illuminate in this entire conversation with regards to internationalizing the struggle is intersectionality. Yeah, absolutely. And we did an entire episode on that. There you go. <laughs> I think it was episode three or four. It was an early one. So, yeah. It, it, so it was yeah. in the early days. It was in the yeah. early days. Yeah. We definitely did an entire episode on intersectionality. And um, Kimberly Crenshaw created that terminology, intersectionality. She's a lawyer, I think, at Cal Berkeley, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yeah, so, and, and she summarized basically everything that we need to do with regards to inter intersectionality. It's like, hey, look, oh, I'm from this group of people and I have an issue, oh, well, I'm from this group of people and I also have the same problem. Wow, yeah. that means, you know, that's intersectionality. That's essentially what intersectionality is. I'm sure there's a more Webster's or Merriam-Webster dictionary version of it, but, you know, we don't always have to give you the textbook definition. We just give <laughs> it's you the, true. The life definition and it makes a bit more sense because it's more relatable. Yeah, it's it's basically the the fact that people have intersecting identities and and intersecting uh, ways in which we can interact with the world and the world interacts with us, mm -hmm. including you know the relations we have with with other people, and that's uh, really it. Just makes makes our lived experience an intersectional one in the sense that you know we're all different and and have all these different factors that play into how we present and show up in the world exactly exactly and when we talk about intersectionality and we just define that terminology there's when you have a connection with somebody who is not of your race or gender or some sort of social or political or personal identification, but you have some sort of unity and agreement, we call that word, and it's one of the terms that we have defined here, solidarity. Mm, yeah. Solidarity, okay? And solidarity is when you have unity or agreement with somebody else that shares your common interest, mm -hmm. okay? That is, so intersectionality and solidarity, they're connected yeah. because you can't be intersectional and not have solidarity. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. If you're intersectional, by default, you have solidarity. Mm -hmm. But solidarity, typically, it implies that the group of people that share the common interest are homogeneous. With right. intersectionality, the groups of people that share that common interest are heterogeneous. Yeah. Yeah, can be as diverse as the world around us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then when you think about, this is before your time because you weren't born yet, but I, they, I'm, I'm old enough to remember this and it sounded like an old man when I was your age. God, I never got <laughs> to get to that point. But this is probably about 30 years ago. There is a Polish activist and the term solidarity, you really started to hear this term solidarity from a Polish activist. He was a socialist Polish activist named Lech Walesa. Mm. He was a Polish electrician and he fought for workers' rights and he had a trade union and the name of the trade union and the movement was called Solidarity. That was literally the name of the movement. Wow. And it was a pro-democratic initiative that it was designed to overthrow the communist government of Poland at the time. And he eventually rose to power and became the first democratically elected president of Poland, Lech Walesa. And the airport in Gdansk, Poland, it's actually a really nice airport. I've flown through that airport once years ago. I've never been to Gdansk, but I flew through the airport. The airport in Gdansk, Poland is named after him, mm. Lech Walesa. And he, Lech Walesa is still alive. He's, he's in his late 70s. And he's, wow. doing, he's on the speaking circuit. He's doing lectures all around the world about his movement, the solidarity movement. And when we talk about solidarity and we talk about labor unions and we're talking about 
uniting people with a common interest, whether it's solidarity from a like-minded group of people, for example, a particular labor union of electricians or grocery workers or Amazon package delivery people or butchers at your local grocery store or, or postal carriers, or whether you're talking about a group of LGBTQ lawyers and a group of National Football League players, okay? It's that sort of intersectionality and solidarity that's needed now more than ever across the world to bring people together to overthrow the governments that continually oppress their citizens around the world. Now more than ever, we need people like Alec Valesa in the United States. We need somebody like Alec Valesa in Canada. Mm -hmm. We need somebody that's going to be that's pro workers rights, but then is able to unify people, not only intra industry, but inter industry. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And it's very interesting. I think, I think we're gonna run out of time in this episode, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep this vocabulary episode going for a part two Absolutely. next week. So please yeah. tune in if you're listening to this one. Uh, we're gonna do it live again on Tuesdays as we do every week with the Joe and Cat Chats. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's super interesting because we're gonna go through sort of uh, what sort of all these political terms mean when it comes to applying them in our own lives with political parties and, and all these things, because I mean, the point about having a political party is to unify your country to, um, you know, believe who believe in, in the same policies as you believe and want to implement those things. And so, I mean, the, the division that there is right now is particularly in our countries, Canada and the US and in many, many, many other countries uh, around the world. It's, it's not, so like there is no solidarity and those divides are, are becoming stronger and stronger. And so we do need to have a unifying uh, thing, you know, uh, yeah. ideology or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that goes back to the comment you made about, you know, internationalizing the movement because okay. the rich are just getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Yes. And we're all experiencing the same struggles when we really look at things from an intersectional lens. And we do, you know, we're all human. We have to, we have to consider that. But humans have different things that are, you know, part of their own struggle. And, and that's why intersectionality is so important. We need to be able to relate to other people that don't have the same struggles as us because we need to identify those struggles as our struggles. Absolutely. And that's the whole point of, of how we started these chats. Like, you know, race is, is something that should not exist. It's a made up thing, but it totally li exists in lived experience. It's a real thing for, for everyone. Absolutely. It doesn't, you know, it has real life implications. Absolutely. Just like Dr. David Lee said in that one speech when he, in the um, introduction of Cornell West seminar, he said, race is not a thing. Race is biological irrelevance with so fatal social consequences. Right. That's what he talked about with race. And we have about two minutes left. Um, I was going to go ahead and talk about identity politics, but that might take a little bit longer than two minutes because identity politics really fuels a lot of the divide, but we'll pick up with episode, with part two, so episode 27 of the Joe and Cat Chat series next week. And we're gonna go live and direct as usual, but actually it's not really live and direct, but it is. That's my thing when I do a live, <laughs> but it's live and direct and the Joe and Cat Chats. It's the best of both worlds. It's back to back. You know, it's chocolate and vanilla, it's ebony and ivory, it's salt and pepper. We've got it going and we're cooking. Heck yes. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. We have a lot to talk about next week. So hopefully we can get to that. Um, but for now, I guess we should, we should close this episode with, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you again. You spoke a lot this episode, Joe. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate you outlining all those terms because no it's really important. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll come back next week with, with a bunch more terms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've been busy. I've been busy. We got a lot cooking, but we're a team. You know, there's no I in team. And um, that's it. We've got we've got everything going. Thank you so much. Um, I know it's been a busy week for you, um, doing a lot of different things, moving across the country. But 
we're back together again. And again, we love what we do. We love each and every one of you. And we love what we do. And we're doing this for the people because we are people of the people. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to thank you again, Joe. It's it's always a pleasure. We know, fun. you know, we do these because we care about each other. We care about mm -hmm. you, everyone watching. And we do encourage everyone to comment, share, tag us if you want, uh, you know, challenge us, you exactly. know, <laughs> do, do whatever you need to do, because exactly. this is about communication. And it's about, uh, you know, solidarity in in our own way. And so, yeah, we're really we're really excited to be starting to do these live again. And exactly. Uh, exactly. yeah, and, and you know, and, and look, when once this whole physical distancing thing is over and the pandemic is done, look, if you want us to come to your school and talk for sixty minutes or ninety minutes or two hours, look, we're available for the lecture circuit. <laughs> That's we, true. <laughs> our, we're available for the lecture circuit. We can we can talk it up. <laughs> you know, look, airfare hotel. We can talk about a few other things, all right? We can do that. You want us to come to your cookout and talk for a little bit? We can do that too, whatever. <laughs> We're here for you. Yeah, awesome, we definitely are. Yeah, here open to anything. We're open to anything, really. Wide open, <laughs> wide open, wide open. All right, Kat, we're gonna shut it down. We gotta go, all right? Peace and love, everybody. We're back next week, same, maybe not the same time, but the same day. Episode number 27, we're on the back half of the first year of the campaign of the Joe and Cat Chat series. We're half a year through 26 weeks, episode 26. Time flies when you're having fun and truly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Cat, awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Peace. Gotta go. Bye. Word.